this is the first murder we're going to look at, but uh, <clears throat> just in terms of general statistics, the 20th century is the uh, unchallenged uh, century of violence uh, in terms of the number of deaths. Uh, by 1990, of course, that was a few years ago, state violence, uh, war, pogroms, revolution, ethnic cleansing were responsible for the deaths of 125 million people, which is more committed by the state than all succeeding generations or time up until that time. So from recorded time to the 1900s uh, does not exceed the deaths ensued by, uh, by governments in the state during that period of time. Most of that can be laid at the feet of, uh, of Marx and Sartre and, uh, and Mao and uh, Pol Pot and others that uh, held an atheistic view and did not see mankind created uh, in God's image. Uh, but it all begins here shortly after the exodus from the Garden of Eden with Cain and Abel. Now, uh, Cain is mentioned uh, uh, a few times in the New Testament, and there's uh, one little phrase I could have titled the message, The Way of Cain, uh, which is a reference to Jude. <clears throat> there in Jude 1.10 it says, uh, but these speak, and he's talking about the apostates and uh, false teachers of his day. And he says, they or these speak of evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally like brute beast. In these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. So what does it mean to go into the way of Cain? That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. And certainly a couple of things that are highlighted here is that God has a prescribed approach to God. Uh, and very early on, it's very specific. It's through animal sacrifice. Cain decided he wanted to come to God in his own terms. And, uh, and that's certainly part of going the way of Cain. Also, what we're going to see is that God is very interested not just in what we do in terms of worship, as far as showing up. He's very concerned about the attitude of our hearts and why we do what we do. Uh, and we're going to see that in his life as well. It's kind of like the, uh, the little boy that was being scolded by his parents to sit down at the dinner table and not stand up where he might injure himself. And after a little going back and forth, he finally decides that he would do that. It was in his best interest to sit down. But he let his parents know as he sat down, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. And uh, that, in a sense, uh, can be the attitude sometimes when we come to worship. We're really not fully here, fully engaged. Our singing can be no more than Christian karaoke. Uh, our thoughts are other places. We go, can go through the, the maneuvers and uh, the outward, but God is looking upon our hearts. That's one of the other lessons we'll see with Cain. But it also reminds us of the grace of God. We're going to see that even in that attitude, God reaches out to him. Even after the murder, God reaches out to him by his grace once again. Well, let's look first, and this will be brief, that Eve is convinced that Cain is the one, the one from Genesis 3.15. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. So she's convinced uh, that he's the fulfillment of that promise in Genesis 3.15. Uh, again, through the seed, singular, a person, a man will be born, and Satan will bruise his heel. But this person, we refer to as the Messiah, will crush his head. And Eve, she has a son. God promised, so he must be the one. I've acquired a man from the Lord. He's the man that the Lord promises. And just to mention, this tells us something at least about uh, Eve, and we've already saw it with Adam, that uh, they're back on track with God once again. They're believing God's word. They're believing God's promises and so forth. But it's an implicit declaration of faith here. And of course, she's hoping that he is the child that will defeat Satan. And uh, what a great disappointment uh, that must have been. And how the Adam and Eve must have struggled at times with, uh, with you know, again, just that f having to fully commit their trust in God and God's word and what he had laid out for them despite the circumstances, despite the setbacks, because certainly this would be a tremendous one. Their second son is mentioned here, Abel or Abal. And uh, 
he is born, and, uh, and of course, they end up, in a sense, losing both sons. One is murdered, and the other one is sent away by God. So she's convinced, but Cain's character, secondly, is seen in his worship of God. Uh, verse, uh, again, going on the rest of verse 2. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door, and its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. So first thing we note about his character, it's seen in the type of offering he brought. Notice his offering uh, was basically uh, from the ground. Uh, Abel brought the firstborn of the flock. And, uh, and we notice that they, they both come, verse 3, in the course of time. They knew when to come. And, uh, you know, you can just a, a cursory reading, a quick reading over this, and it's like, you know, well, what's up with this? You know, and they both brought an offering. They both showed up. But there's some very specific things here. In the course of time, in the Hebrew, literally means at the end of days. There's a lot of rabbinical teachers that that is a direct reverence to the Shabbat and to the Sabbaths. So very early on, God has directed Adam and Eve and their descendants that there is a very specific time to worship. And that's already been specified in the creation account as God rests on the Shabbat or on the Sabbath day. There's a specific time. It's not like they both showed up and go, hey, funny meeting you here. Just thought I'd worship God today. No, that's not what's going on. They both came. They both came at a specific time, and the pattern had already been established through the covering of the sin and therefore the shame of Adam and Eve. Remember, we mentioned last week something they would have never conceived of, and that is the death of animals and their spilled blood that was required if at least symbolically and physically their shame and therefore their sin would be covered. So both of these young men, however old they are, but they're men, uh, and responsible, they both knew there was a specific time to come and worship God. And Cain did that. They both knew there was a specific offering to bring to God, and it was an animal sacrifice, and Cain refused to do that. And, uh, and that's at the heart of what, uh, what went wrong here. Now, the writer of Hebrews tells us something else in Hebrews 11:4. There he says of these two men, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it being uh, dead, still speaks. So there's still a testimony of Abel of his life that he was righteous because he came and worshiped God when he was supposed to, and he brought the proper sacrifice. Now, in terms of what's more excellent about his, if just in picture, for contrast's sake, think about Cain's offering, it was probably really beautiful in terms of the fruit, uh, the grains, and so forth, lays it all out on the altar there. Uh, and his was probably a lot more beautiful to look at than Abel's, who brings a, a young goat or a young lamb and slits its throat, and the blood is poured out, and the animal's there to be sacrificed visually, Cain's offering to certainly be a lot more appealing. But, uh, but again, God is not interested in our opinions when he directs us how to worship him or what looks better than the other. Uh, Cain refused to bring an, an animal sacrifice. Both brought an offering. Both brought it, brought, came at the right time. Both had a belief in God. One's life was submitted to God and the other one was not. And it's a powerful lesson we learned right from the beginning. Secondly, uh, we could speak of Cain's offering re were the result of his own efforts. He tilled the ground. There's nothing wrong with being a farmer. Apparently, he followed in the footsteps of his father, Adam. But again, it just speaks of the fact that he's bringing something that he produced by his own hard efforts himself. 
Whereas, at least in type, Abel's bringing something that just naturally occurred. He just brought the lamb that was, that was born. And three, Cain's offering was not the first fruits, and this is very critical. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. And that's what we see in what Abel brings. He brings, it says, the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. <laughs> and it's like, if you're with us for the studies in Leviticus, it's like, it's like, you know, it's right away, it's like, okay, I think I've heard that expression like many times as we went through the instructions for the Levitical priesthood. If you're not, you're going, so what's up with the fat? Well, <clears throat> according to the Mosaic Covenant, it would all belong to God. Uh, and uh, when an animal was sacrificed, that was the part that was completely consumed. Interesting, I heard a guy being interviewed uh, recently, a European guy just wrote a book about science in the Bible where he's talking about things that are scientifically correct in the Bible uh, that we didn't know about till, till much longer. And one of them was the, the dietary uh, situation here that we now know that if we if the fat belongs to God, so the Jews didn't eat any of the fat and none of the blood. Any meat they ate was very well done. We now know that through animal blood and animal fat, there is a tremendous amount of disease that is carried that affects mankind even up until today. And of course, you know, we're kind of, a lot of people are concerned about how much fat is in certain products they're buying because they're worried about their weight and diet and so forth. But, uh, uh, and he went through some other examples of things that are in the scriptures. But uh, this tells us that very early on, God had given what we call special revelation to Adam and Eve. They knew there was a certain time. There was some concept of the Sabbath that was there. There was a particular time to worship. There was a particular type of sacrifice. And not only that it was an animal sacrifice, it was actually some specific instructions along with it that with that animal in particular, the fat portions belonged to God. Uh, they were to given to him. And the reason I'm kind of... Uh, going over and over this is because, again, you could read this and say, well, Cain was doing his best. I don't understand what's going on here. And there's a lot of people that would say that as well. Well, you know, I believe in God, and I kind of go to church once in a while, and, and I worship, and I'm doing my best. And God says, your best will never be accepted. And the only thing that will ever be accepted is when you come under the shed blood of my son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That's the only thing that will ever be accepted. And there's a lot of people that go the way of Cain, and we need to be careful. Numbers 18, 17, again, this idea of the sacrifice uh, and the Levitical system that comes later. But the firstborn of the cow, the firstborn of a sheep, of, or the firstborn of a goat, you shall not redeem. They are holy. You shall sprinkle their blood on the altar. Burn their fat as an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. It's just to say the specifics were in place very early on with Adam and Eve. And that's why Noah, again, 1,400 years uh, before we ever get uh, to the Levitical system, the Mosaic law, when he gets off the ark, you remember what he does? He takes on unclean animals that he intends then when he comes off, he makes an altar and he makes animal sacrifice in worship and thanksgiving to the Lord. Abraham was known as a man who pitched tents and built altars as a witness and testimony because he was a pilgrim only passing through and he was worshiping the one true God. Isaac, Jacob, this all continues and it all is very specific and it all is uh, a thousand years plus prior to Moses and the Levitical system. So the problem with Abel is really a problem of the heart. And we're going to see that uh, this young guy was, uh, was very arrogant and, and it comes out later. Uh, again, the writer of Hebrews tells us that Abel brought his offering and it was by faith. Uh, it would continue to be by faith. That's how we, we come to God now. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So quite a contrast between the two offerings and the, uh, 
the final lamb, of course, that comes that is sacrificed is Jesus Christ. It's John the Baptist that says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now, there, there's a building up to that, of course, because right now it's one man is sacrificing one lamb for his sin. And later during the Passover, again before the law, one lamb would be sacrificed for one family or one household. And then under the Levitical law, on the day of Yom Kippur, on the day of atonement, one lamb would be sacrificed for the sins of the nation. But when Jesus, the Messiah, comes, he becomes the one lamb that is now sacrificed for the sins of the entire world. So there's a pattern that's established very early on, and Cain refuses to follow the pattern. And uh, quite a contrast between these two uh, young men. So it's, uh, you know, sometimes somebody just asked me the other day, they called and had a question and were listening to one of the uh, radio programs and, and so forth. And we're talking about sharing about prophecy with, with a friend and the friend responding how interesting it was and that they themselves believed in God as though a belief in God were enough. But again, Cain had a belief in God. It wasn't, it wasn't ever in question uh, whether he believed in God. Did he believe in God? Uh, his mom and dad were in the garden, had many conversations with God. Uh, there was this like cherubim, like right over there, this big angel with this flaming sword. And uh, yeah, I think they got it. They, they had a pretty anchored in their belief in, in, in God. Uh, when Adam and Eve taught their kids about creation, the ACL, ACLU did not intervene. I mean, it was just, it was just that was it. They, they had a belief in God. Uh, and he, he even showed up at the right time. But a belief, a generic belief in God is not enough. Uh, again, it's James 2.19 that says, uh, you believe that there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So even the demons have correct theology and they have an emotional experience. They shudder. But that's not enough. It's where they're, but their lives are not submitted to. And that's the issue with, with Cain here. Now, his character, again, is seen in his attitude. Now, we mentioned uh, his attitude uh, in terms of the offering, but uh, verse 5 speaks of it when God confronts him. It says, and Cain was very angry, and the Hebrew tells us this means extreme anger. So he kind of does his own thing. He knows what he should be doing, but he says, I'm just going to do it my way. Uh, I can approach God any way I want to. I don't know if he said there were many roads that lead to God or not. Uh, or if he said, God's not in competition with himself, so it doesn't matter how you approach him. It's just whether you're sincere or not. I don't know if he said any of those things, as people would say today. Uh, but certainly he believed his sincerity was enough in what he was doing. Uh, yet when God confronts him directly then, uh, he, doesn't, he does not repent. He doesn't say, say that, I'm sorry, you know, uh, you're right. I don't know what I was thinking. You know, he doesn't do any of those things. God confronts him and says, hey, you're, you're blowing it here. And his response is, he's extremely anger, angry. Who's he angry at? He's angry at God. Uh, and his anger at God is going to drive him eventually to actually kill his brother. And we note also that uh, in his character is seen the fact that the murder is premeditated. Notice Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field. So he actually takes, again, it's his little brother. He takes his younger brother, his little brother. And it's very interesting if you even think about it. They probably looked a lot alike. There's only one mom, dad thing. You know, there's, they probably looked a lot alike. And, uh, and he takes his little brother because of the anger in his heart at God. And because Abel was a righteous person. He takes him out in the field and talks to him and gets him away uh, and, then, and then murders him out there. But it's interesting, brother is used twice in the text speaking about uh, the murder. And, uh, and it's in uh, Hebrews as well as Matthew that we have the, the phrase that Abel was a righteous man. Jesus would even call him a, a prophet. It's Bonhoeffer that says he murdered him out of hatred for God. Now, you think about King David later. King David, of course, when he uh, rises to the throne, he's there in Jerusalem. He's on his rooftop 
uh, at uh, some point in time, he notices uh, Bathsheba uh, on the roof, and you know the story. Uh, rather than repenting from that at that point, he invites her over and ends up having an adulterous relationship with her. And then to cover his sin, he has Uriah the Hittite murdered, which was probably along with, it was in a, a, a military uh, situation where they were near a wall and, and uh, he has the, uh, the guy in command pull troops backwards. So uh, Uriah is probably murdered with a number of other men uh, along with it. So it's not just his murder. Uh, but all of this, of course, David then thinks he's gotten away with the sin. And, of course, Nathan the prophet eventually comes to him uh, and, uh, and confronts him. And David realizes of his sin and then writes about it in the, in the Psalms. In, in that ensuing period of months and so forth, uh, he says, My strength was sapped as in the summer heat, and, and your hand was heavy upon me. And he talks about what he went through in terms of conviction. But when he finally confesses his sin, remember he says, and, uh, and it's to, to you and only you, to God and only God have I sinned. Hey, what about all the guys that died? And, you know, well, yeah, the sin was against them, but what, what, how did the sin come about? Because of his anger with God. There's something we can really learn here. When we need to be very careful that when we're disappointed in life situations because God doesn't do what we think God ought to do for us, our anger against him, and, and we get angry at God sometimes and we need to bring it into check, God's going to say that kind of anger in a moment is like, like a lion that's crouching at your door and you need to bring it into check. If you don't, it's going to destroy you. Cain had that anger. David had that anger because God says, I can't do this. I'm doing it anyway. God says, I can't have this. I'm doing it anyway. Cain says, God says, I can't worship him this way. I'm doing it anyway. And there's, a, there's a, just that he, a refusal to submit an anger of God that leads to other things. Now, one of the other New Testament writers that talks about Cain is John. In 1 John 3.10, he's trying to contrast this idea that rather than hatred in our hearts, there should be the love of God in our hearts. And if there's hatreds in our hearts, there's something wrong with our relationship with the Lord. 1 John 3.10, John says, In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. There's a bit of jealousy that's involved here as well. And he goes on in verse 13, he says, Do not marvel, my brethren. If the world hates you, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So the absent of love is hatred. And he says, when you have that in your heart towards your brothers, not only do you not have eternal life, because if God's poured into your life his love, then that love should be manifest in your other relationships. But when you harbor that kind of hatred in your heart, you've gone the way of Cain. Your relationship with God has been affected, and now it's being manifest in terms of other illustration. Cain becomes the illustration of a life of hatred. Notice verse 12, his own actions were evil. There's two words in the Greek that he could have used for evil. One means to do something wrong. That's not the word that he used. This word means you're so wicked that you want to bring other people down in your own wickedness. And that's Cain. What a contrast between these, uh, these two brothers. Uh, believing was not the problem. Submission was the problem. Let's go back to verse 7 because I want to deal with this issue of the idea of sin crouching at your door where Cain is cautioned by God. Uh, if you do well, will you not be accepted? If you uh, do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So, it's God that is cautioning him here. Don't you want to be accepted? Don't you want to do well? 
Don't you want to bring the right sacrifice with the right attitude? Don't you want to turn this thing around? Do you still want to go down the road that you're going on now? Uh, and notice, secondly, he's cautioning in regards to, again, the idea of the desire of sin. He lays out the consequences. And when God, God speaking to him, he likens it to a lion that's crouching at the door. He's ready to pounce. If you go out that door, you're going to be destroyed. It's pretty awesome when you think about it. This punk kid, basically, young guy, who's got this terrible attitude. God says, bring an animal sacrifice. Not doing it. Just going to do what I want to do. And you just got to take it, God, because that's what I'm doing. That's, that's the attitude, right? Uh, and then his brother's sacrifice is accepted, and his isn't, and he's, he is extremely angry. And God comes to him and says, let me warn you of something. Let me caution you. If you step out that door and keep going down this road, this sin, your anger against me, is going to destroy you. It's like a beast. It's like a lion. Why are you downcast, right? Because he's angry and downcast. He says, won't your face and your countenance be lifted up? And, it's, and it's, again, it's speaking about his relationship with God. Even at this juncture, there can be a change. There can be repentance. And God is, is crying out. But he, God uses the personification of a beast crouching at the door. Boy, I wish we had that picture of sin. You know, when we're about ready to step into the trap or into the threshold or uh, what Satan has for us and when we're dealing with the anger in our own hearts. James 1.14 says, Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth to death. Uh, James is a little more gentle. He says sin is, sin is almost like the birthing process. There's something that's conceived, and, and it, that takes a period of time for development. Eventually, it's going to give birth, but what it gives birth to is death. Do you really want to, to go there? So God is very concerned about the attitude of the heart. There's a basic refusal to submit to God and something very basic in terms of, uh, uh, of worship. Now, Micah, again, summarizes for us what God was really looking for and maybe what typified Abel and his sacrifice. In Micah 6.6, 6, there the prophet says, With what shall I come before the Lord? Because that's what we're talking about. That's the context. Come before him in worship and bow down myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? 10,000 rivers of oil. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? That's what Abel did. It, it, it's not the animal. And it doesn't matter if you bring 10,000. And if you have 10,000 rivers of oil, Micah said, God's interested in your heart. Why are you doing what you're doing? Is it enough just by rote? Sometimes we talk about people that aren't saved, but they're churched because they, they show up and they know what to do and what to say and they, knew, they know the, the protocol and what, what to go through and they probably know the songs and the appropriate time to lift their hands and a lot of other, other things. But God is interested in the, in the heart. And uh, it's like the, uh, the uh, old country western song where... Uh, the chorus says uh, the mom wants to know about this young man that wants to have her, her daughter's hand in marriage. And she says, I want to know, is he, is he washed in the blood or just in the water? In other words, is he, is he gone through some little, little ceremony or is he, is he actually know the Lord? And uh, that's the concern. That's what's going on with Cain. So Eve's convinced that he's the one and what a disappointment that must have been. Cain's character is seen in terms of his worship and his approach to God. He's cautioned by God. And eventually here in verse 9 to 12, he's cursed. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth 
which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a va vagabond, you shall be on the earth. So Cain is questioned here before he is cursed. And notice God's right on the spot, very much a similar scene to the sin of Adam and Eve. They sinned, of course, uh, in taking the, eating the fruit that they were forbidden. Eve is deceived. She passes along to Adam. He uh, makes a volitional choice to sin at that point. And then God is right there on the scene. You know, where are you? Where are you? You know, what have you done? Why are you hiding? And it's, it's not a, a strong voice of condemnation. It's, it's what's gone wrong. Don't you want to talk to me about this? And it's a similar thing here. Where is your brother Abel? That's an opportunity to confess right there. The response should have been, I can't believe it, but I killed him. You wonder what God's response would have been at that point, if there would have been some remorse in this. But there is, there is no remorse. In fact, uh, he is completely uh, indifferent, uh, and he says, uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, he completely lies. You've got Adam giving uh, some pretty stupid excuses uh, in terms of their sin. Well, it was the woman that you gave me. So, in fact, God, it's probably your fault that this has all happened. But Cain doesn't even do that. He just full-on lies. I don't know. I don't, I don't know where he is. He had a pretty limited view of God, didn't he? I mean, he was very aware that God spoke creation into existence, but he doesn't understand that God is omniscient and knows everything. He thinks he can kill his brother, throw some dirt on his body, and God doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't know about it and uh, doesn't understand the, the grace that God is reaching out to him, even at this late stage. Notice the progression of verse 9. He lies. Uh, I don't know in response to the question of what have you done. There's a refusal to accept responsibility, that uh, very familiar line, am I my brother's keeper? He's more concerned about his own rights than any responsibilities. Uh, basically, he's very calloused, and he's saying, if he's dead, he's dead, and I could give a rip, is what Cain is saying to God at, uh, uh, at this point. And we're going to notice in a moment that the next thing he does is begin to plain, complain and say to God, and you're unjust in this punishment over me. So this is a guy that, uh, man, all the opportunity in the world and all the evidence and the belief and all, but no submission. And sin, again, distorts our ability to reason. It produces in us irrational acts, uh, and that's what we see here. Cain is cursed because his sin can't be denied. The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. It still cries. It's like, don't you, don't you get it, Cain? Cain learned something he had not previously considered, and that uh, Abel's body, though covered with dirt, was actually not hidden from God. One, uh, one Old Testament scholar says that according to the Old Testament view, blood and life belong to God alone. Whenever a man commits murder, he attacks God's very own right of possession. To destroy life goes far beyond man's proper sphere. Spilled blood cannot be shoveled underground. It cries aloud to heaven and complains directly to the Lord of life. And that's a very scary thought, that, uh, that there, there is no innocent life that is ever taken that God does not know directly about. That blood screams directly to the throne of God, who is the author of all life. And that ought to scare us to death in this country because of the abortion issue. We've talked about it in terms of seeing God's judgment, the things he has to say about the children of Israel, and why they're taken into captivity, because they were sacrificing their children into the fire. And I tell you, I fear God a lot more than I do Al-Qaeda. Now, we've got to fight our enemies out there, but we need to be very concerned in praying for mercy for our country and a revival because as the blood of Abel cries to the throne of God, and that's one of the things that we see here, so does the blood of every innocent human life that is taken here on this earth. Now, the writer of Hebrews then speaks of the blood of Abel and the blood of Christ together. It's an interesting contrast. Hebrews 12, 24 to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Because what did Abel's blood speak of? 
it really spoke of judgment. Abel's blood is in the ground, and it spoke of judgment. But the blood of Jesus Christ speaks of grace and not judgment. And that's why uh, the, it says here that it speaks of better things than that of Abel. Well, let's look lastly at Cain's complaining. Once again, met with grace. Verse 13 to 15, And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. So his complaints, uh, he says to God, are too severe. I'm driven from the face of the ground. I'm hidden from your face. That's a consequence of the sin. I'm a fugitive. I'm a vagabond. I will be murdered myself. Not a lot of remorse here, is there? He's not there saying, I'm so sorry. I can't imagine what this is going to do to my, my mother and my father to know that I, I, their son, have killed one of their sons. He's not concerned about that at all. He's not concerned about Abel. He's not concerned about anything he's done. He's saying, this is too severe. I should have some rights here. It's kind of the call of the day, isn't it? It's all about my rights. It's not responsibility. It's all about my, my rights. That's the way of Cain. It's not feeling bad about something. Uh, is not the same thing of, of turning from it. Cain, in a sense, falls to pieces here, but there is no compassion in anything that he says. Note the progression, verse 3, the attitude in worship. Verse 5, extreme anger. Verse 8, jealousy. Then deception. Then finally, murder. And he thought the punishment was too great. But notice it's met. Even this complaining is met with grace. And certainly this is the first time in Scripture that we have a human being being cursed. The serpent is cursed. And now this is the first human that is cursed. Uh, a tragic distinction here. Uh, and, but God would put a mark of protection over him so that others would not harm him. Of course, this led to all kind of, kind of speculation as to what the, the mark was. I like what one rabbi said. It was a dog that walked next to him and protected him. I like the dog story, but uh, it's about as viable as any others. We don't know what it is, but God put a mark upon him so that no one else will kill him. You're worried about uh, being murdered? I'll make sure that you're not murdered. Uh, and God, in his grace, even does that. Verse 16, we'll get more to it next time, but notice it says, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. The, uh, Nod is a term for wandering or exile, and it may not be a particular place. It just speaks of the condition that Cain found himself in, walking away from a relationship with the Lord, a refusal to submit to, to the Lord. He finds life frustrating. He just wanders. He's just a vagabond. That's the way of Cain as well. That person that might have that mark of grace upon their life, because they've got a belief system, they know about the Lord, they even believe in God, they may even believe in the Trinity, and they believe that Jesus died for their sins, but they've never submitted to him. And they just kind of wander around, and life is very frustrating, and life is not meaningful, and life doesn't seem to have any purpose to it. The Jewish people found themselves in that same condition, though they had all the right belief system. But because of their idolatry, they went into the Babylonian captivity. God, in his grace, as prophesied by Isaiah uh, and by Jeremiah 70 years later, uh, come out of that uh, captivity. They go back, and under the uh, direction of Ezra and others, they're going to rebuild the temple. But it's not really happening. And Haggai is one of the prophets on the scene. And he says this to him in, in chapter 1, verse 5. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put in a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Is life frustrating to you guys? 
what are you supposed to be doing here? Putting the Lord first. And he goes on, he says, why aren't you building the temple instead of paneling your houses? In other words, they're kind of really trekking out there. Uh, they had a the nice crib they're building, <laughs> and, and nothing's happening over there on the Temple Mount. And the prophet says, when you don't put God first in your life, life is going to be frustrating to you. You're going to be like the wanderer and like the vagabond, and you'll always wonder, why do I keep running into this dead end? Why doesn't it ever work out for me? And that's the way of Cain as well. A lot of things that we can learn from this young man. We come to faith in Jesus Christ, not by our own works, not by our own efforts, not by anything we have made or can do, but by God's grace. The attitude of Cain, this anger against God, is dangerous because God says it's like a beast waiting to pounce on you. And of course, the solution is turn to God and receive his grace. The uh, hymn writer Horatio Bonar once said in one of his hymns, Not what these hands have done can save this guilty soul. Not what this toiling flesh has borne can make my spirit whole. Thy grace alone, O God, to me can pardon speak. Thy power alone, O Son of God, can this sore bondage break. It's only by God's grace if we'll just turn. And he's so gracious, even, even to a guy that, like Cain, and right up to the end, still calling out to him, how he, he calls to us to get that attitude check. I know some of you moms do that with your kids. Hey, watch that attitude. Hey, change that attitude. And God does that with us a lot. You know, because if we can get the attitude right, everything else kind of just, everything else just kind of flows out of it, doesn't it? Even our character and who we are, if we, if we get the attitude right with the Lord. 